Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Terra Firma, covering the topic of coal mining and other ground hazards. My name is Lucy Quick, and I'm the Digital Marketing Manager here at InfoTrack, and I'm delighted to be joined by Seb Colcutt, Account Manager at Terra Firma, who will be taking you through the session today. Good morning to you, Seb. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Lucy. So before we begin the webinar, I would like to draw your attention to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We will be running a Q&A at the end of this session. So please type any questions you might have for Seb, along with your name, into the Q&A box. That way, if we run out of time or your question requires further clarification, we can then extract your information and follow up with you directly afterwards. This session is being recorded um, and I will share that with you afterwards so you can refer back to Seb's notes at a later date. That's all from me for now. I will now hand you over to Seb. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, as Lucy kindly introduced, uh, my name is Seb Colker. I'm the key account manager here at Terra Firma. Um, so a, a brief run through uh, of what I'd like to cover today with yourselves is a, um, a history behind mining as a whole. So whether that includes coal mining and non-coal mining, um, the history behind the CON 29M, uh, how it started and sort of how we got to where we are now in today's society. Um, a brief update to uh, a solution that, that we brought forward of our updates um, to support that. Um, why they're important, of course, for the industry as a whole collectively. And then moving on to more our ground report, uh, and again, providing the sort of the history behind that, but again, supporting it with the solution with our new updates. And then also some other changes that we have made behind the scenes more recently. And then as Lucy kindly alerted to just the, the Q&A function at the end, uh, in which obviously I'll, I'll do best to answer any questions you may have. So to start with, um, just wanted to give you a, a brief run through of what, what a town probably would have looked like through the years, um, starting back in the 1880s um, and sort of how um, historic mining has grown within these areas. So this is an example of a town in the late in Industrial Revolution at the end of the 19th century, uh, in which mining would, would often occur at, at the edges of settlements uh, as they had to be a convenient distance, as you can imagine, away from um, the local towns or villages. Uh, the mining features here would usually be sort of shafts and surface quarries, as well as sort of large underground workings um, that the mine shafts obviously would have access to. Now, typically when the mining area was abandoned, the open pits would be backfilled uh, and the mine shafts were often capped with nearby material, sort of things like um, wooden railway sleepers. Um, but as you can imagine, these, of course, would rot over time uh, with them being in the wood. Um, but during this time, uh, with mining and industry sort of growing and legislation struggling to keep up, it was only until 1872 when it became a legal requirement to actually make mining plans and, and keep a record of, of these relevant mine shafts that, that were being worked on. Um, and of, of course, prior to this, there had been already a huge amount of mining before this legislation even became into play. Uh, and again, something I'll go on further when I develop into the history of the, the CON 29M. And then as you can see, if we fast forward obviously to the 1960s, um, the, the word of mouth legacy would have been passed down and people would know about the mining features. Um, so there would be difficult ground conditions, as you can imagine. Therefore, people were, would not sort of not know to, to build on it. And as a result, the town would grow around these features rather than sort of over them. However, over the sort of 50, 60 years uh, following, this population grows and the word of mouth, of course, would then fade. And then as you can see, uh, moving on into the 20th century, the, the 21st century, should I say, sorry, people would build new properties and, and land overlying the historic workings, which is probably why we have the, the relevant issues in uh, today uh, and why the relevant mining searches uh, and ground reports are all still uh, required in today's society for the conveyancing process. And, and again, just really pulling that in, you can see the, the new build properties there and obviously where the old mine shafts used to be worked on. Now, really building on that, so what, what I've just discussed there is uh, a brief history behind the CON 29M as a whole and the report itself. So as I touched on in uh, 1872, um, there was a, the, the mining register was introduced uh, in which um, it had to record all mines worked over 
um, uh, at the time. But again, as I touched on prior to this date of 1872, even though mining obviously was back hundreds of years ago, um, in fact, it was a case of uh, the mine shafts or the mine recordings not being uh, written down or um, recorded anywhere at all, uh, which again is probably why we still have the issues today. It then led further on into 1947 that uh, a nationalisation occurred in which mining legislation was introduced um, and it was their duty to remediate uh, any subsidence to a property caused by coal mining when it was nationalised. It then led on to uh, the point of there being, uh, or there needing, should I say, a governing body um, to, to, to look after it and obviously sort of steer the ship, as it were, um, in which the coal authority was formed. Uh, obviously, their, their resounding thing to, to take on responsibility for public safety and liabilities. And of course, within these time frame as well, the reporting on coal mining began to uh, begin within the conveyancing process. And of course, as you can imagine from, from them being formed, it then led, led on to the creation of the CON29M report, uh, which is in the early 2000s, uh, in which uh, the Coal Authority provided initially just to solicitors alone. Uh, and as we know, since then, the Cheshire Brian will see added to the CON29M, but also in 2018 since been removed. But then also led into uh, 2018, where Terra Firma uh, were the first non-public body to be licensed by the Law Society uh, to produce their own CON 29M. So really now um, branching out and uh, into society. And that really brings me on to um, sort of the, the solution behind that education now and, uh, and the history behind it. So um, as of last week, we uh, here at Terra Firma had our updates, which we feel um, uh, as building on our innovation and education across the industry. Um, so as of uh, Monday the 18th of October, uh, we introduced non-coal mining hazards to be clearly outlined within their own section within the report. We also, for those that you do know, we provide the expert interpretation and professional opinion and next steps provided in each and every case. So again, on every report, although we've added in non-coal mining now, we still have the, the, uh, our, our expertise and everything behind it. And I suppose it offers a big enhanced protection for conveyances to ensure that um, the false sense of security offered by the Coal Mining Substance Act in 1991 is not incorrectly relied upon. And again, that's something I'll very much um, focus on uh, shortly in the next coming slides. But the, the big one for, for everyone in the industry is why is this change important? So sort of breaking that down into numbers, you can see here that just short of 174,000 mine entries are recorded within the Coal Authority database. Um, now, with, with, with those, uh, we estimate that only one in three are actually recorded. So as you can imagine, there could be well over 500,000 um, that are still there to be located, should I say. Um, just sort of 14,000 mine entries are recorded for non-coal extraction within the Coal Authority database. And also just short, just over, should I say, 21,000 mine entries are not actually owned by the coal authority themselves. So again, uh, I've got a slide to show you shortly, but it will revert back to um, who, who then takes sort of responsibility and liability for those mines. And then breaking that down into size bandings, you've got 32, or just over 32,000 hectares, which is the total area of non-coal workings, again, within the coal authority data. Now, as you can appreciate, I keep reverting back to coal authority data. So um, with the CON 29M, uh, it's rules and regulations, of course, um, it is only coal authority data we can use. So with our, our, our non-coal mining features that we now are reporting on, um, that, that is all within coal authority data. And then bringing that into a visualization for yourself, so you can see here the relevant coal mining areas across the, the England and Wales, should I say. Now, the non-coal feature I want to bring you on and educate you on today is seeing the amount um, the, of the non-coal shafts that actually rely in these areas or lie in these areas. As you can see, the majority of all coal mining areas have quite a large substantial um, making of non-coal shafts, whether that obviously be fire clay, um, ironstone and lead, uh, and also sandstone probably being the, the, the three key factors. But again, really, you can see um, the reason why we wanted to introduce this now within our reports uh, and to really continue our vision of educating the industry. 
And then again, reverting back to um, the statistics I just showed you on the previous slide there with um, the coal authority, uh, the mine which is that are not actually owned. All these, again, within the coal authority data, the white dots here actually indicate all those shafts that, or mine shafts that are actually not owned um, by the coal authority. So again, reverting back to obviously mining has been done over hundreds of years. You can really revert back to um, who, who now has responsibility and liability for these coal mines. Um, and imagine if there, there is one that needs maybe investigations, who's then liable for the costs involved. Um, if the investigations obviously show that the property probably is impacted by the, the mine entry or the mine shaft itself, and there needs to be work carried out, who then pays for the remediation. Um, it, it, like I say, it really sort of adds that or highlights the, the confusion there that, that needs to be investigated um, by solicitors uh, when uh, purchasing the property. And really just to support that with a, a, a nice case study, really. So as you can see here, this is a, a mine shaft recorded beneath the building, uh, the property in question being the, the red highlighted boundary. Um, and as it clearly indicates there, you can see the mine shaft in the corner of the property uh, and the red circle there indicating the uh, zone of influence. So within the coal authority reports that you tend to order now, you'll see that the, the zone of influence is a standard 20 metre buffer. However, within um, Terra Firma's Continental M report, uh, we actually indicate um, the exact zone of influence. So rather than it being a standard 20 metre buffer, we actually indicate that the, the exact amount that the property in question uh, could be at risk to from the influence of it. But this report in general, um, we were able to carry out our own report uh, and able to determine something quite different by using historical mapping. So as you can see here, we were actually able to indicate that the mine shaft location, in fact, was uh, approximately 40 meters west of the original plotted location. Um, so you can clearly see there with being able to use the historical mapping um, that we can really sort of zone in on the, on the, on the correct identity and just really sort of highlighting the, the need to um, use various data sources, so not being constricted just to the one uh, and, and using uh, every uh, bit of information available to us. Um, but again, as I said, I'll touch on our revert back to the Coal Mining Substance Act in 1991. Um, this here, Mine Entry Act, actually um, was um, extracted flag or documented to extracted flag rock, which actually is a non coal mineral, um, where unfortunately. Um, the coal authority actually do not hold any liability for non coal mining features. So within this instance, um, the Nate, well, well, great news, should I say, for the, the actual property in question, um, to the, the mine entry is not causing any impact to their property. So, of course, it will pass and fantastic news for them. Unfortunately, bad news for the neighbouring property in which um, they're more than likely when they do, if they ever do come to sell, the, the purchaser might be in for a bit of a shock knowing that information is there. But the, the Coal Mining Substance Act in 1991, uh, as I touched on very much, will just probably doesn't highlight the, the or doesn't hold the liability for non coal mining features. So in fact, we'll just cover you for coal mining. So again, really reverts back to um, that industry education, should I say, that um, everyone just assumed that when carrying out the Coal Authority report, um, re regardless of the results, should I say, you, you were covered by that coal mining substance out there. So it's really key to highlight the fact that if it is a non coal mining feature that is highlighted, um, you, you may not be liable under the Substance Act. Um, so something to take forward. And again, really with us highlighting that now in our reports, um, or the non coal feature in our reports can really support and help you with that. Um, probably the big question, why now? So non-coal mining, as we know, have existed in coal refrigerated data for years. Um, so, so why is it the change is only happening now and the solution being brought forward? Um, I suppose the first one being, yeah, president has been set by the coal authority by their reporting on any mining data within obviously their rigid format. Uh, and obviously we're realizing that not, they're not clearly highlighting the non-coal workings. And I touched on it probably resulted in the industry education that when I say carrying out the coal authority reports, regardless of the results, um, there was an assumption that people just knew, thought they were covered by the Coal Mining Substance Act and that it would apply in any case. And obviously, in addition to that, the structure of the Con 29M, uh, as I touched on at the beginning there, the, the rules and regulations, obviously, with the coal authority creating it, uh, we have to abide by um, their, their structure, of course. So the only relatively sort of recent offering to, to license to private or commercial firms um, has been 
making changes and innovations to the continent of Nine very much difficult. However, um, that, that has led to Terraform being able to um, should say use all the relevant cold authority data and review it over the last few years, um, which allowed us to identify the scale and extent of these non coal working. So it's worked in a positive in that way. Um, it's a technical review, uh, what we were able to carry out, should I say, a technical review of the coal authority's duties uh, and the responsibilities, which allowed us to recognise that the coal authority are not necessarily responsible for these hazards, even though it is recorded within their own data. Um, but and obviously it's now led to our continued efforts, which is obviously to educate the industry on these hidden hazards, alongside obviously the challenge in exploring the limits of the content and M format now means that this innovation can be brought forward within our reports. So just the key takeaways there from, from, from that first part is that not non coal mining hazards do exist within coal authority data, um, despite their age, and they continue to pose a risk to property and require appropriate risk assessment. Um, it's also important to consider and be aware that the coal authority may not be liable for any damages at sites within the influence of non coal workings. And also that non coal mining hazards in coal mining areas do extend beyond the coal authority mining records. So remain important to consider also. So again, really reverting back to that, not um, relying on that one bit of data source. It's always key to have various data sources um to to gather the, the the full investigation and making sure that the reports that we are carrying out are as accurate as possible for you then moving nicely on to our brown report so again really behind our sort of industry education is that the ground report we, we created the ground report should i say to highlight um all all, all ground hazards um, whether that include mining or, or any other features now very much wanted to keep it different from the environmental side of things so contaminated land flood etc that was all put to one side as we see we want to really highlight just the one area that we want to have our expertise in and this is why the ground report was introduced so the the big one um being is that obviously the the education behind the ground report we wanted to obviously keep innovating and educating the, the industry um the first one what we've helped with that is probably a redesign of our front page um, for those of you that have ordered our reports before, you'll see it was very much, um, should I say, a wordy um, or more detailed front page um, with writing. So what we've really done now is really um, took that back in, sort of um, cleared it and to reduce the congestion, to make it more of an at-a-glance review that we have on other reports. We also have the addition of our terra firma quality assurance stamp, uh, which you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, clearly demonstrating the expertise embedded in every report. So that was there to highlight, um, of course, um, Tom, our CEO and founder, um, and the rest of the guys behind the scenes are very much obviously qualified geologists and very passionate in what we're delivering. Um, and, and so probably why terra firma are, are where we are today. Um, so we really wanted to start highlighting that within the report and show the expertise there um, that we have readily available. And again, making it easier for everyone um, uh, in the industry, should I say, is a, a reader friendly approach is improvements being made to site plans, which will allow clearer visualization of data and the hazards. So again, as you can see that imagery there, you can see the property in question being the red highlight boundary and obviously the ground hazard with its zone of influence, um, as you can see there, which is uh, clearly highlighting that it may or uh, what well, it will impact the property in, in some shape or form. But again, it will make it simpler for everyone reading upon the report exactly sort of where the ground hazard is and the relation it has in impact on the property. And a, a big one that, again, I'm going to touch on shortly, which is the um, enhancement of our natural ground perils module, which will enable a improved hazard specific assessment um, and also help uh, a better provision of advice and recommendations when moving forward with our reports. So, again, clearly highlighting and um, detailing to everyone involved in the conveyancing process. Um, the, the, the key aspects and the takeaways from the report. So you don't have to spend that time reading through the report um, when we're just giving you the, the next steps and the, the, the assessment there for you. So the, the, again, more of an education piece on the, the importance of the, the, the natural ground perils update. So uh, natural ground perils have uh, classically been divided into six distinct categories by the British Geological Survey. Um, one being uh, collapsible deposits, as you say, the impact there on the property in question. Uh, you also got compressible ground. You've got landslides, running sands, clay and shrink swell, and also soluble rocks. 
Now, as you can imagine, all these hazards can affect all property uh, and have traditionally been presented in the way that suggests they pose an equal risk to property, um, re regardless of, of, of what, what they impact. So, of course, that is why we introduced, again, the, the, the ground, uh, the natural ground perils module, should I say, within our ground report. So, with that in mind, with the update, we've now sort of pushed forward with that. We now use, again, more additional data sets to aid the assessment of such ground hazards. So, again, as I touched on, similar to with the content, and then we're not relying on that sort of one or two data sources. We're trying to use as many data sets as we can um, to help give uh, a better assessment of each hazard. Um, also, bespoke recommendations. So, we'll be offering bespoke recommendation and advice. Um, issued for each natural ground peril identified. So again, clearly highlighting what each ground peril, um, if obviously highlighted, and how that will impact the property, but also for everyone involved in the conveyancing process. So whether that be the conveyancer, the purchaser, and maybe even in some cases, the lender. But also making considerations for the development of sites um, provided, which can be passed along to your builder. So again, really sort of honing in, obviously, we appreciate there's a, a lot of new build work um, going on with the industry, obviously, in present in the last few years, very much been a big push on that. So we've really taken into those considerations for um, to be passed on to the builder. So again, to make the builder aware prior to, to, to works being begun on relevant sites. And then um, finally, moving on to some other changes that we've, that we've made to our products and services uh, across the board. So um you may see a lot of a refreshed branding across all our reports of course we appreciate that um more recently we've made more improvements to the ground report and we very much realized that uh, there was a bit um of inconsistency from a branding perspective across our report so we really took them in and um sort of re rejigged them around should i say and made it give it a more consistent and fresh approach we've also made an uh, as i touched on there with the natural ground perils module an improved provision of new build so giving um, specific recommendations for the new build properties. And a, a big one being a, a creation of an FAQ page on our, on our website. So again, we really want to simplify the process for everyone involved in the process. So not just providing our reports onto solicitors, we really want to make everyone aware in the process um, of this. So we've created an FAQ page on our website now. Um, and obviously we appreciate with the, the PDF reports that we do provide, um, there will be a, a page or a link embedded to each page uh, within select reports that will allow again just to speed up the process of any questions anyone has in the conveyancing process they'll be able to click the link and see if uh, that question can be answered um, quicker than not to contact the solicitor or the solicitor with the, uh, uh, the reseller etc or coming directly to ourselves and then uh, one obviously the, you, you won't you won't see but of course making behind the scenes improvements to our terra firma report production systems and ordering platform again to help simplify and speed up the process for all those involved um and i suppose that, as you can imagine as, as more and more updates get introduced into the reports um the, these tech things tend to happen as standard uh, the improvements being made but again um one one wouldn't work without the other so um really having that there to to push forward with our reports and yeah that 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 brings me nicely to the end so yeah thank, thank you very much for for, for listening and uh, yeah pass back to to lucy to handle the the q a lovely thank you sab um oh let's have a look and see if we've got any questions We haven't got any questions yet, but I'll give it a couple of moments to see if we get any that come through. Yeah, not to worry. Um, what I will do as well, just on the next slide here, put my contact details down. Appreciate if people, those that don't have any questions, uh, you've got my contact details there, or you can contact your uh, account manager at InfoTrack um, with, with any questions that you may have for me at a later date as well. Perfect, thank you. Just give it a couple more moments, see if any questions get typed out. Yeah, no problem at all. Lovely. Well, I think, Seb, you've covered everything. Um, just to confirm, as Seb just said, if you got any questions that do come to you after the session, you can contact Seb directly using the details on the screen, or you can follow up with your InfoTrack account manager who will be able to assist you. Um, Seb, thank you very much for your time today. That was a really great session. 
No, you're very welcome. And thank you for having me. And yeah, big thank you to you, Lucy, and also InfoTrack as a whole. And then, yeah, just to reiterate yeah, what Lucy said, just if anyone does have any questions, um, yeah, please contact the InfoTrack account manager or my details are on the screen there. So yeah, feel free to get in contact with me. I'm always here to help and support anyone. Lovely, thank you. I think all that's left to say then is um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we hope you have a lovely rest of your day and a lovely rest of your week.